is one o'clock here on the East Coast. Thank you for taking your lunch hour or whatever hour this might be for you and joining us. Um, we've got a great group today. We have nearly 200 online um, all across the country, a couple of people out of the country. We've got business owners. We have some of our private equity partners, real estate partners, and a couple of our vendor partners with us today. So thanks for joining. I always like to kick off our masterclass series for the year with this update on the industry. And not to say that we're any smarter than anybody else about what's going on in the industry. It's just that we listen a lot. And all we're doing all day long is talking to people about what they're doing. What are you doing in your curriculum? What are you doing in your training? What are your issues? What are you buying? What are you selling? What are the numbers? What is it, you know? You know. So um, our fun is collecting information, sharing it with you guys, getting feedback from you and taking that to the next place. So love to hear from you afterwards. Please give us any feedback that might be useful for us in making this 2019 series the best it can be for you. And, um, and please participate. So we are using Zoom for 2019. We changed our platform. You guys will notice that if you're not familiar with Zoom, if you go hover over the top of your screen, you will see a Q&A section. Love to have your questions as we go. I will stop about 15, 20 minutes uh, before two o'clock and take your questions and love to have some interaction. If we don't get to all of your questions, and that's typical, uh, we will respond to you in written form. So we're not gonna leave you hanging. We want you guys to know as much as you can to be as successful as you can in this new year because there is so much going on. I don't know about you guys, but it's almost overwhelming to this poor brain. So, um, also, you're going to notice that I am uh, using Prezi, which is our platform for presentations. We started that last year, and it's fantastic. I love the way it moves, but I could not this morning get uh, my presenter view going, so you're just going to see it like I see it, and well, hey, it's not today's biggest problem, right? And as backup, there's paper. So um, we're always prepared, and we will be sure that we get you the information, which is what's important. So um, let's get going with what we see is going on in the industry. What happened in 2018, where we see 2019 going, predictions from us, you know, ours is as good as anybody else's. Um, we all just wait and see what actually happens, right? But um, I'm going to jump into this information and love your feedback along the way, like we said. So first of all, here's what we have planned today. We want to tell you about some opportunities for learning and connections in 2019 that the Hinge team is putting together along with some places that we're plugging into that you, you might want to consider as well. Um, we want to tell you about our content for 2019 and we're really excited about that. Then we want to tell you what's happening in the world of transactions. Who's selling what? Who's buying what? What are they paying for it? What's the process look like? How, how is it going in the world? Because what's going on out there in transactions affects you guys and how a transaction for you, if you're a buyer or if you're a seller, you need to know on both sides, you need to know what the values are and you need to know how this is working and what, how the bar is being set that sets the bar for you. Then we want to talk about what we see happening on an operational level, because in my 33 years, so um, just go ahead and put it out there, um, 34th year right now, I've never seen more advancement in what's happening on the operational level. I'd say in the last three years or so, very advanced concepts in how we operate our schools with systems and processes and curriculum and connections and staff. Um, so a lot going on and it's a lot to keep up with. So we like to share what we see there, what you might want to think about and also plug into. And then what's coming up next year? What's going on? So let's jump into that. 
All right, first of all, um, just a couple of things going on at Hinge. The first thing is our second annual business conference shift is happening next month. We're really excited. We're about a month out. Uh, we have the most amazing um, speakers this year. I, I'm blown away every year by the people who step up and say, we would love to share what's going on in our organization. We wanna meet people. We wanna talk business. We want to talk financials, which is being counter loves. We want to have a couple of days just dedicated to that. We had a great time in San Diego last year. We're in Austin, Texas this year at the beautiful Kempton Hotel, right in walking distance to the awesome food trucks. We have an opening event at a cool container bar. Across the street the first night, we've got some socializing opportunities. Also, we're launching an app this week for our guests and uh, the app will allow you to share your profile and connect with people before you get there so you see who will be there you'll get this uh, have a closer download on sessions that are available and get to know some people make some connections because that's what we're all about this year's content uh, for both shift and our master class series and most everything we're doing this year is built around succession planning what we want for you guys is not to just own a job. We want you to have a plan for your business. As a matter of fact, we'd like for you to have a lot of plans for your business because you have to be ready when you need to be ready and then be opportunistic. If a good acquisition comes along, you need to be ready to buy it or move into it. If a buyer comes along and you need, uh, and they offer you a tremendous amount of money, you need to be ready to consider that. Maybe you'll say no but maybe the opportunities out there and you need to be ready. So it's the content for shift. It's our entire masterclass series. I'm excited that our celebrity guest speaker is the author. You can see that mine's well loved the author of built to sell John Warlow. John will talk to us about the same. His, uh, he counsels people across the country and his roadmap for being ready and continually thinking about the future of your company. The shift content will be the same. We'll talk to you about what your options are for your business, what your options are for your real estate, how things get priced, what the process looks like, what you need to know and do in advance. So we're excited about that because that's our, those are our go uh, topics. Our two industry keynotes are also brilliant. Uh, we have Roger Neugerbauer, who is the iconic, I'm so excited, iconic um, founder of Child Care Information Exchange. Hope you guys get this magazine. Um, I'm happy to be speaking right when it came out because this is their January, February issue. And every year in January, February, they print, um, I thought I could flip to it quickly, um, the top 50 companies in size in the country. Why do you care? Because those guys set the bar for everything that happens in our industry. So you'll see that list. You'll also see an article about what they're struggling with, where they're going with their growth, what they think is important and challenging in the industry. And I had the pleasure of helping write that article this year with Roger. So take a look at that. Roger is also the founder of the World Forum on Early Education that's happening in China in April. Um, also, I, along with Kathy Petchel and Molly Petchel on my team, are all speaking there this year. We're excited about that. Roger is giving all of our um, contacts a discount, which will, if you'd like to consider going, which will come out um, in about a week. So look for that. Um, but again, lots of other speakers. I think we have 25 speakers. We'll have a lot of fun. We'll take good care of you along the way. We want you to have a healthy experience. We've got some masseuses going on at lunch and, and a trail mix throughout the day. Good food, um, good sessions. And um, if you need more information, let us know. We, lent, we self limit to 300. We want this to be a small group, intimate experience and I think we're maybe about 20 away. Um, so still some seats left. Um, the conference, the hotel block is full. Sorry about that. But on the website, you will see some options in the area if you'd like to attend or reach out. We'll do everything we can to help you get there. Um, second thing is we, we do a lot of speaking for other organizations. I'm headed down to Savannah, Georgia in a couple of weeks. 
I'm going to speak at their owners and directors conference on healthy expense management. So love our, our partners at GCCA. So we're excited to be there. If you'll be there to, you know, say hello or reach out to me in advance and let's, let's get connected that way. Um, and so state of the industry in early education, let's talk about transactional trends first. There were two national transactions that impacted the industry last year in 2018 in a, in a majorly good way. Two of the national groups sold. And why is that a good thing for you guys? Because if they sell at a certain place, that sets the bar for the selling price for everything else to get sold in the industry. So Nobel Learning, one of our favorite companies, we love working with Nobel, sold from one private equity group to another. Rainbow Childcare out of um, Detroit, also one of our faves, sold to Kindercare, another fave. So a lot of rolling up going on. But Rainbow's 160 schools went to Kindercare. Both of those were reported at record numbers on the selling price. So good news for everybody in the industry. Once things set a new bar for um, selling prices, then that sets the bar for everybody else. So a lot of activity, a lot of competition for selling products. Um, as we list things today, we get more competition for it than ever before, especially things um, that are in high-end markets that have well-maintained facilities and awesome curriculum. So as we talk about operational trends, very important that you guys keep up with what's going on in the industry and keep yourself, your business, and your team fresh as there's a lot of new growth, as you'll see. Uh, the franchises um, are still reported at the as the fastest growing segment of the industry. Some of the larger Primrose and Goddard's, Kids or Kids, um, Kitty Academy have been growing steadily for several years. There are some emerging under them. There's some hybrid companies, KLA and others that do company owned plus franchises. So I'm going to be interested though because our uh, community based companies also grew very quickly last year through new development, new brands, new growth. You probably have seen in your markets people building new buildings which will make things like keeping yours up to date and new very important. Um, so I'll be interested to see, I, um, in my head, I feel like there's probably just as much growth right now in community and in, um, in schools that are non-franchised as schools that are franchised, but reportedly those guys are growing really quickly as well. The national guys are building in new markets, so they love to acquire companies that are already operating very well, but they can't find enough of those that they like. So they're building in new markets. You've got Kindercare, I mentioned just acquired Rainbow, um, and they acquired my friend Pat Fenton, who was their CEO, and Pat will be building new schools for Kindercare. So you'll see that they plan to do 25 a year. So that's, that's pretty strong. Second largest group, Learning Care Group, who operates La Petite, Child Time, Tutor Time, Children's Courtyard, Montessori Unlimited, um, Kid, I forget that one, and um, their new STEM brand called Everbrook is building also in new markets. So new STEM brand going on and new concept there. Um, of the other guys that are, you know, right behind them in size also have pretty aggressive building programs. So new and shiny is coming into your market. Again, very important for you to stay on par with that. I'll give you some strategies for that. As I said, um, you know, in my 33 years, I've never seen business values as high as they are right now. So what people are paying for businesses is at an all time high. We saw a little higher peak on real estate in early 2018. There were three interest rate increases during 2018. So we've softened that just a little bit, not drastically. So it's not, uh, it's still stronger than it was before 2018, but not quite to the same degree. There's a lot of 
there are a lot of opinions, as you can imagine, about where our economy is going and whether pricing will remain as strong as it is right now. Most everybody feels like, you know, if you've been around as long as me and people who've been around longer, you've seen it. We cycle up and down. Um, and so you know that we're at a peak and most likely we will soften a bit at some point. Most everybody's opinion is that would be in 2020, new election year, um, could cause some little bit of a, a dip in, in the strong economy that we have going on. Who knows, you know, I, I fall short of counseling people because none of us really know, but that's kind of the buzz that we hear from most people. We have new entities trying to put their money into early education. So it's amazing really that we are a darling industry right now. We have been recognized as an industry that's very stable economically. And I know any of you that survived 2009 and 10 are rolling your eyes and wanting to throw something at me right now because you probably struggled along with other people. But as compared to other industries, we saw about a 10% revenue decline and about flat on the bottom line, which means you guys are brilliant at managing your costs um, and adapting your salaries, which are main expense when things dip. Other industries did not fare as well, and it's being noticed by investors in the industry. So private equity just means an entity that takes private individuals' money and invests it. Most of the larger national companies are now private equity owned. Um, we have one publicly traded company, meaning you can buy their stock, and that's Bright Horizons. Um, Bright Horizons does a lot of employer-sponsored care. We also have a speaker from Bright Horizons at our conference. I'm so excited. I had a call with her yesterday, and she's going to talk to you guys about how you can participate in Bright Horizons backup care program in your market. So to get some enrollments from industries that Bright Horizons works out and partners with you on. So I don't know exactly how it works yet, but Sandy Wells will be there from Bright Horizons to talk about it. We have to be creative, right? So um, we're really excited to hear that content. But uh, Bright Horizons publicly traded. Most everyone else of size is private equity owned. Um, lots more of those guys and international money. Uh, trying to get into our early education industry. So that's been fun. Great people. We've, we've enjoyed um, getting to know them. I think we now have 350-ish entities trying to get into the industry that we talk to on a regular basis. So that's fun. Um, more options for real estate funding and sales. So we, we do have um, entities that specialize in owning real estate in our industry. We've done a couple of things with some of our clients in that we have helped them use their real estate for growth. For instance, we've got a, um, a dear friend in Texas. He had two schools. He owned the real estate. We sold that real estate for him and he used those proceeds to grow into a third school. So um, another thing is um, I'm a fan of real estate ownership, but they, it takes a lot of resources, right? So we're going to talk a good bit about that at shift. But to shift that resource into growth or business growth is a great strategy for people because we really like to grow, you know, grow smartly, grow well, but grow and keep awesome people engaged to the point that you decide to exit. So you're either, you used to work with a great guy that would say you're either green and growing or you're ripe and rotten. That just won't leave my head, as you can tell. Uh, but a great thing to remember that great team members want you to continue to create opportunities for them. But we like where we are with being able to get lending and funding um, for growth. So always happy to give you, that's not our core business, but we do have contacts and we are happy to give some brain space if you guys need it. Uh, national, well, it's not just national organizations. Everyone is performing well right now. Uh, people are working. Our unemployment rate is at an all-time low. 
We have um, infants off the grid. I think that's just, a, I've heard varying opinions of that, but I think it's just an um, indication of people's um, optimism about where they are economically. So most everyone has waiting lists in infants. This is not today's soapbox, but if you have an infant waiting list, raise your rates. Um, and you can raise them on incoming families. So I actually think I get to that in just a minute. But everyone's performing well. So this is the time, if you have fallen behind in tuition rates, if you have deferred maintenance in your building, if you need a re refresh of your branding, which you're gonna hear me say you need to do every 10 years, if you need a bus, whatever you need, you should be performing well in this market. And I know this is a bold statement and I know competition is a thing, but I really feel like when people are not performing well in this market, they need to look in their house and see what's going on. How is your director doing? Are you selling well? Does your building need a little work? You know, are you up to date on systems? What's going on? You should be performing well. So that's kind of what's going on in the world of transactions. It's a busy time. Uh, the Hinge team has doubled in the past year. We have went from five to 10 members. We're now located in, um, I'm based in South Carolina and our transaction manager, Carrie, is here with me, but our brokers are in New Jersey, Denver, and California. We have team members in Nashville and um, another in California. So we're, we're spread out to help people. You know, we're trying to get more support for you guys as you go through different things in your company. So that's kind of what's happening on the buy sell side, what's happening operationally. And this, the reason this is important is this is where you guys have to keep up. And like I said, there's a huge, there has been a huge inflation of requirements the things that used to make us special in the industry are required now. I remember the day when teaching a foreign language was special. Well, you have to do that now. And really teaching it isn't as important now as immersion, which is just um, bringing the teacher in and switching languages for a certain amount of time. That's how children learn better. I remember the day when computers or, you know, heaven forbid iPads, but computers in the classroom were special. They're almost a requirement now as well. Some people self-select out of that. Um, they don't like that concept and that's fine too, but um, at least to address it and know that it's important to parents is a requirement now. STEM concepts, it's a requirement. So really, there's so much to do and focus on now um, that that inflation has gone crazy. So, you know, I'm preaching to the choir because you guys are here, but keep yourself up to date on the trends and implement things that are special. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we still see as special right here. Uh, first of all, let's just talk about funding. Um, if you participate in subsidy funding sources, the, the big three have always been stable and, and rising. So um, if you see volatility in these subsidies, they're usually in the state portion, the state match portion, but where they come from on the federal le level, always been stable. So the first one is the Child Development Block Grant, been around about 25 years. Um, it's our main source of money that flows through states to help parents who need subsidized childcare. Um, there was a huge increase in that funding in 2018. Some of the states are still trying to figure out how to implement it in their state, but it's out there, so watch it. Um, the second one is Head Start. Head Start's about 45 years old. Um, what we're seeing with Head Start is more collaborations. I'll talk about that in just a minute, but Head Start is very well funded. You should get to know your entity in your city and how you might partner and work together. And the third is the USDA food program. If your school has about 30% mix of subsidy versus private pay, you probably qualify for the food program. The food program 
takes a lot of paperwork and bureaucracy, it's completely worth it. It should pay for the person to do the paperwork plus all of the food in your school is kind of a rule of thumb. Not just for the 30% that qualify, but for every child. So look into those three programs. I've seen a lot of business owners almost go out of business because the demographic changed in their market and they refused to switch over to a concept where they need to consider um, alternative payment sources for their families. I wouldn't do that. I mean, if you don't want to do it, sell your school and let somebody else do it. Because if your demographic changes, go where the money is. You know, it's, it's the same mission. It's just different families. So I'm a big fan if uh, that's where your school goes, then go with it. Um, most people will feel like a mix of, like I said, 30% subsidy, 70% private pay, holds a good healthy demographic in your school. You know, there are schools that are 100% subsidy and that's fine too. It probably will continue to be 100% subsidy and there's nothing wrong with that. But um, also if you want to consider a split, 30-70 is a good rule of thumb. So I mentioned early Head Start and Head Start. So early Head Start is infant to three, Head Start's four, or maybe the three goes with a Head Start goes with four, I can't remember. But we are seeing increasing popularity with Head Start entities and working with private organizations. So um, some of our favorite models are that they might um, the typical one is they will contract you to provide a class in your building to their specif specifications. So they have certain teacher requirements, ratio requirements. They will equip the room for you. I've seen capital improvements like floors, beautiful playgrounds. Um, and again, they, they have, um, they're very well resourced. So I love that model. At times, we'll see them mainstream students into your classes. If you have room for a couple more four-year-olds, this is a good one. You know, they'll mainstream them into your classes. Uh, the way to get into this, if you aren't already, every dis business decision in this industry and everyone is a relationship decision. Get to know the person and the entity in your county that is the designee for Head Start. So Head Start is federal money. It flows through counties, through a nonprofit, a 501c3 that receives the funds and makes the decision on where to put their money. Just find out who that person is and call them up. You know, get to know them, invite them over. Say, you hear they're doing great things. You would love for them to come over and see what you're doing. You don't know how it might work, but maybe there's a way to work together in the future. Just get to know that person. Then when things happen and they need a partner, um, you're there, and that's a great way to fill your school with funding sources that are very strong. So um, we've seen a lot of our clients use that as a growth mechanism in the last, I'd say more and more so in the last two or three years. So check that one out. Surprise, people are struggling with staff issues. So um, not surprising, look, what we just said, uh, we're uh, unemployment at an all term all time low. So we've been through these cycles. We either don't have enough children or we have plenty of staff or we have plenty of children and not enough staff. I don't know about you guys, but I'd rather have the children and deal with creative ways to manage the staff. And, and it is a struggle. So I do not mean to minimize that. We did our whole webinar series in 2018 on strategies concrete things for you to do to find good people, to compete with other industries for people, to compete with other early education, how to onboard, how to train, how to develop a strong culture, how to deal with the M words. I mean, you, the millennials, I know I'm hearing you say it all the time and you complain until you need a, you know, cell phone um, fixed uh, or whatever it is they do well. But it is a real struggle. If you guys go to our website, you can pick up all of the former masterclass series and watch those there. You'll find 11 for last year only on staff issues. Uh, in addition to the struggle with, uh, you know, they don't show up for work. 
Um, they don't show up for the interview. They want to tell me when they're working. Um, all of those struggles. In addition to that, what we saw about, I'm saying about 18 months ago, I started to notice that our clients were having to pay more, I'd say about 10% more for incoming team members. It's almost like a minimum wage increase. So because if you have to pay more for them, you have to pay more for the people who are already there, right? So we saw this little inflation and imbalance in staff cost and the percentage. We have certain benchmarks we like for you to spend on your staff cost. And we saw people starting to struggle more with that. It's why I'm getting so preachy with you guys about your tuition rates, because more than ever before, we have to charge the cost of services. I see and work with business owners all the time who are killing themselves to do a great job for people, but they're not caring for themselves. And if you aren't, you cannot ever do a great job for people. So um, to charge for the services you're actually providing is critical. We don't want, you're not helping anybody if you go out of business one day, right? So um, uh, there's also, you know, from a couple of years ago, we did a whole series on financial concepts, accounts receivable, tuition rate setting, um, discounting, that's my biggie. A lot of times it's not so much the struggle in the tuition rate, but how much are you discounting? And we have some benchmarks for that as well and strategies for shoring up some of that. If you don't find the information you need from one of our masterclass series, reach out to us because very important for you guys to keep that. But across the board, struggles with staff culture Last year and this year, our whole Saturday content at Shift is related to staffing. We have a speaker from Indeed this year. They're located in Austin. We said, hey, come on over. Talk to us about strategies to get people's attention on platforms like Indeed. So we're excited about that. Um, but big struggles, number one thing we hear. When you read this article in Child Care Exchange, you are not alone if that's what's happening to you. All of the national guys cited two things. We're, we're trying to grow quickly. Number one issue is staff. So we're all in this together. There are no big secrets. Let's all share and help each other. We're all stronger. We're all stronger, right? Okay, so here we go. But there is more confidence in increasing tuition rates and reducing discounts. I'll give you guys a couple of little strategies. First of all, I think you need a set of precedents for increasing your tuition rate every year. You need to communicate it well to parents. Hey, here's what, thank you for trusting us with your child's education. Here are the things we accomplished last year. I know you accomplished things. We should, you know, we're doing such great things in this industry and we really stink at telling it to people. But here are the things we did last year. Here's what we have planned for 2019. Share with them that in this labor market, you're, you know, you want to stay ahead of quality education and you're paying more for teachers. It's okay to say, I know that you are, and they understand what the struggles are too. Tell them what you're doing. Tell them what the tuition rate increase is. Um, consider along with a tuition rate increase, whether you can reduce any discounts. I see a real industry walk away, push back away from free days in any form. So if your parents are not paying for holidays, if you're giving them a free week that they don't show up, the industry's working its way away from that. I still have people that say all my competitors do it, and if I don't do it, I'm going to be killed. Okay, maybe you have to do it. But for the norm, most people are able to eliminate this. I love the communication that, hey, to meet our rising costs, we, we need to go up $20 a week in your tuition. We understand and want to you know, respect the struggle that you have as well. We will go up $10 and we're gonna eliminate free days. You know, they're happy about that right now. Next summer, they might be mad at you when they take a week off, but you know, deal with it for a year and get through it because discounting uh, can kill you really quickly. What I like is for all discounts to be around 10% of your total charges. So typical discounts are um, free days, again, 
get rid of that. Uh, staff discounts, which I think we're always going to do in this industry. Um, multiple child in the same family. We have some industry discounting. Some of you guys are having to discount agencies because the agency won't allow you to charge the same tuition rate. Um, I'm going to go back to staff discounts for just a minute. There are a couple of things going on there that are trends. So our industry norm is free childcare for directors and half price for everybody else. It's kind of been the long time industry standard. Some people are doing a couple of things differently now. There are people now that are not discounting infants. You know, your child needs to be two, two and a half before they start getting a discount. The second thing they might do is limit the number of children that get a discount to two in a family for a, a teacher. So um, your first two children get a discount, then you pay, you know, for other children. So there's some strategies that are going on that try to limit some of that. This is a tough one, though. I will say it's a tough one because you guys are trying to hire and you want the best people you can possibly have. It's one of the few things we have. You can never pay them enough. You're competing with the school system. We get it. Um, but for them to have their children there is a big plus and to get a discount on their childcare is also a big plus. So this is a tough one. I get, I get that one, but just sharing some ideas for you. But again, look at your total discounts to total revenue. If it's more than 10%, we'll try to help you with some strategies if you want. Um, but I think most people would, um, my range is eight to 12 basically, but hovers around 10 you'll be in line with most everybody else. Oh, this is one. Man, these, these uh, parent groups love their credit cards, don't they? So um, here's, uh, here's my benchmark. I have developed a financial benchmark. I call it my silent business partner. I first put it together 25 years ago when there were, I was um, operating a company that I had about 120 schools. And there were, same thing that we've created with Shift. There was nowhere to go to talk about business things. You guys know that there is really nowhere to go in the industry to talk nitty gritty financial stuff. That's why we created Shift. It's why we created the content that we have. So one of our sessions was to share our financial statements. Woo, I'm gonna count it. If you don't know me well, the bean counter and me went crazy. I took the financials back, I spread them out all over the conference table, and I looked and studied each line item, each expense category, each discount. And what I found out was that if, if a company was financially healthy, the way they spent money was almost identical as a percentage of the revenue, you know, not dollar wise, schools are all over the place. You might have 30 kids, you might have 300 kids, you might be religious based, or you might be after school only. There are a lot of different models, but as a percent of the revenue, if they were paying rent to, to a building and they were paying teachers and um, it was almost identical. So for 25 years, we have tempered this with the financials we get on a regular basis. We, we see the financial statements of most of the large national guys. We don't share these, they're confidential, but we know um, they're part of our transactions and we know what's being spent. We're just looking at trends. We see them for larger multi-sites, for smaller multi-groups, individual owners all across the country in different size buildings. And I have watched this for 25 years. So in 25 years, I've changed two things. I love this because this just talks about once you get this concept and you're financially healthy, you've got it. It's not like it changes drastically every year. So in 25 years, I've changed two things on my model. They almost canceled each other out. We got more cost effective at marketing. So those expenses went down. We used to do yellow pages and yellow pages and they were very expensive. And now we do more social media marketing and it's much more cost effective. So that went down at about the same rate that employee benefits went up. So as I got started, I think I got two vacation days a year and, and that, that was it. I, I didn't even get <laughs> reduced childcare or anything else, but today we have to provide health insurance and, and uh, discounts and, um, 
you know, uh, we have to be competitive or we're going to lose people, right? So those were the two things I have changed. There are two more things I'm watching, and I have not seen them stabilize enough for me to say I'm changing my model. The first one is what I've been talking about, about staff calls. Maybe people are struggling and we won't shore it up with the percent they spend on staff payroll versus their revenue because we've got some benchmarks but people are struggling and you know as much as i'm preachy about those tuition rates maybe they can't get the tuition rates up to at the same rate they need to to keep that ratio healthy so i'm watching that um it's a real struggle but we're going to struggle as an industry unless we figure that out so i'm going to help you guys figure that out Second thing is this parent group loves their credit cards and their points. So we're seeing more and more of our clients accept credit cards and those fees can be really high. I think it's worth it. I think it's a great strategy. It cuts down on the amount of time you're chasing money. Um, there's some strategies with ACH and things like that that aren't as expensive. But more and more people are accepting credit cards because their parents want to pay by credit card. So we're watching those things. Uh, branding. I love to talk about this. So let me just give a shout out to my buds over at Better Beans Branding. I call them the beans. Um, Thad Joyner is a person whose company we sold about five years ago. And Thad came from the restaurant industry and he had a real strength from that experience in branding and branding a building branding um, and branding is much more than what does your building your website and your colors look like it's what is your company about what does the look of your marketing say about that does it communicate it well what do your people communicate how do they answer the phone how do they tour how does it compare with other things in your market? And these guys are, have a real focus on the industry because of Thad's background. And I'm not one to, look, I don't get paid by any vendor ever. Let me throw this out there. I won't do it. People say all the time, you know, I like to collaborate and, you know, I'll give you a, I'll give you a fee if you recommend us. If I like you, I'm going to recommend you. So I just keep myself away from that. But the work these guys are doing are fabulous. You heard me mention new and shiny coming into your market. I believe that your building needs to be completely refreshed every 10 to 15 years. I'll give you a great example of a company doing this well. We do some work with Primrose, the franchise group. Um, when Primrose has franchisees at the end of their um, franchise agreement, they allow us to sell them outside of their franchise. I can go in 40 year old buildings and can't tell how old they are because Primrose forces their franchisees to, to completely refresh their building about every 10 to 12 years. And it's a phenomenal strategy. They're 40 years old now and bright and shiny comes in. They're still competing. When they get ready to sell, they're still getting top dollar. It's a good strategy. So invest in your building. If you lease your building, get your landlord to do it. I'm a landlord, so I own a couple of childcare buildings. And in 2018, my tenant called me and said, we would like to completely redo the building. Will you give us $150,000? I don't have $150,000, but I'm happy they want to invest in my building. So I just went back to the bank where I have my mortgage and got them to increase the mortgage. I gave that money to my tenant the building looks fabulous. So they increased the rent. And so now they're paying me back that way. Go to your landlord and say, I really like to do these things to the building. What can you invest in exchange for increased rent? It'll more than come back to you in that increased rent. Um, so um, tour stops, we talked about how you tour, how you answer the phone. Um, Better Beans is coming back by popular demand to shift. They spoke there last year. They're speaking again. They're hosting happy hour one night. That's why we love them really. But, um, but they're doing great work. I'm sure others are as well, but I just know these guys and their focus on the industry. So just um, do a shout out to them. Very important. 
Um, so STEM and STEAM concepts that have been going on a long time. So I have clients all the time saying, what are these new STEM and STEAM brands? We've been doing this for a long time. Well, yeah, but again, who are you telling? So there are new brands that are uh, promoting themselves as STEM and STEAM schools. And um, they're making a lot of um, splash in some markets with um, parents who might be engineers or NIT who understand and appreciate STEM and STEAM concepts. If you're doing STEM and STEAM concepts in your curriculum, be sure your parents know it, include it in your marketing, put it on your website, um, be sure that you're uh, appropriately marketing all the great things that you're doing in your school. Uh, but you will see some new brands. You heard me mention Learning Care Group, the La Petite family just launched a new um, STEM brand called Everbrook. Maybe you've seen that in your market. Um, but consider the way you're communicating what you're doing. Outdoor classrooms, wow. Um, Outdoor, not just um, playground equipment, not just a little activity board or a chalkboard. We are seeing outdoor classrooms being used as an extension of the curriculum. And some of the things going on are just blow me away. We got into this big about a year ago when one of our shifters at Shift, we choose five people who are business owners across the country to talk about some cool concept they're doing. And one of our speakers last year in San Diego talked to us about her outdoor classroom. And then we toured her outdoor classroom at the close of the conference on Saturday. And what they're doing there is incredible. This year, one of our two um, industry keynotes, Eric Nelson, who um, has developed training and certifications in outdoor learning is one of our speakers. So he's going to keynote. He's also going to do a breakout session on implementation of outdoor classrooms, how you can get this to work in your school. So we're really excited to have Eric there. I've seen some cool chicken coops. We've got kids playing in the mud on the kitchen center outside. Um, it's just phenomenal what's going on outdoors. So i um, Pay attention to that, by the way, it's less expensive than that big old playground equipment that you might need to replace. Always thinking like the accountant, right? Um, but we love the new concepts going on in outdoor classrooms. So um, that's kind of what we're seeing in the industry. Um, we would love to hear from you guys what else you are seeing, if you're seeing something different than we are. We've got some um, questions up here that I'm going to hop on here. Um, and then we would love to take yours as well. So um, again, the top of your screen, you'll see a bar for questions. And uh, just click on that link and throw them out here. Um, are staff tuition discounts considered? I love this question. Thanks, Mike. Um, are staff tuition discounts considered taxable income for staff? Looks like the IRS says yes. So uh, um, I just hit this question with one of our national guys. So Mike, I'm not sure that I have the legal answer for you, but let me tell you what I'm hearing. I've heard several people, so what Mike is saying is if you give your staff half discount, is that benefit for the half they're not paying for, is that taxable? does it need to be reported on their W-2? Um, Mike says, looks like the IRS says yes. Well, I've heard that from several other people. I don't pretend to be a tax expert anymore. Uh, maybe I was never an expert, but at least I um, used to uh, produce tax returns. I asked recently one of our national groups and their answer was no, they do not tax it. They really didn't say to me that they didn't consider it taxable, but they don't tax it. Um, I think we'll throw that one out to the, our Hinge research team and see if we can come up with the legal answer for you guys. But I thought that was pretty interesting that um, as you get bigger as a company, your exposure to more legal issues like that gets greater. You get paid, a, you know, licensing will let a single school 
get away with some things that they wouldn't let a national operator who comes into the same building get away with. It's just life, you know, so your exposure grows a little bit the bigger you get. But thanks for that question. And we'll continue to try to research and put some information out there. The staff don't get paid enough to pay for your school. The staff do not get paid enough to pay for your school. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I know what that means. You're right. We are never going to pay staff enough. You're, we're just not. What we can do is create an amazing culture for people in, in a place that they want to be in a place that they want to work. That's always been the case. In the 33 years I've been in this, um, it's not just this job market. We're never going to pay them enough. We have to make them feel good. Um, when you hear me get uh, preachy about tuition rates, um, it's because I see people really struggling. Business owners who have put everything they own on the line and they should be thriving. They should be. It's okay to provide great education, great opportunities for people, but also you have to take care of yourself. So the struggle is, is concerning. I just don't think people are helping themselves or, or the people they care for if they don't take care of themselves. But, but I get it. I mean, I know it's real. Absolutely. In New Jersey with minimum wage, yeah, boy, am I hearing from people in Jersey with minimum wage continuing to increase. Is there any way around helping with this cost besides continuing to raise tuition to your families? Um, I wish somebody would, would tell me that there was a different way other than increasing tuition. I will tell you that in, you know, again, 33 years, I've seen a lot of minimum wage increases. And my experience is that there's an inflation of everything when minimum wage goes up. So people expect cost to increase in everything that they do when there's a significant minimum wage increase. And I think you guys have a significant one going on there in Jersey. And um, from what I hear, um, I, I wish I had a better answer for you than tuition rates. What I will say is do the math, know what you have to charge to produce, to provide the same wonderful curriculum and you just got to do it. You know, you've just got to communicate to families that that's why you're having to increase. And um, with 50 to 55% of our total tuition dollars going into staff, we're more vul vulnerable than other industries. Um, what I have found is typically parents um, accept that reason as a logical reason because they understand it. Um, if I get some great um, uh, ideas for you from other states or other people. I'll share those along. Uh, grants a good way to get additional funding. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. There was a time where we saw grant monies um, available abundantly. Then there was about a 10 year period where they seemed to only want to go to nonprofits, right? Or just they were gone because people were not giving as much as they used to. We're starting to see grant funding open back up again. Um, pay attention to the industries where your parents work. If there's some in your general area and a lot of your parents work at that place, have them ask if there are any grants available or give the um, company a call and ask if there are any through their company. We're also seeing an increase in grant funding through states and state initiatives for star ratings and other um, quality initiatives. So yeah, you have to look in your area, look in your state, but we are seeing a um, increase in grant funding. So really glad for that. Can we comment on the potential impact of universal pre-K? Um, yeah, as being, that's being advocated, sure. Um, I will say that universal pre-K has for 20 years at least been in the business uh, arena, uh, one of the biggest concerns for our industry. In practice, it doesn't seem to have damaged the industry in 20, 20 years. So a lot of people say, oh, universal pre-K is gonna wipe us out. And then others say, we've been talking about that for 20 years, we're cool. Um, if in fact a state or, a, or the country 
implemented full day three and four year old kindergarten and it was free and only in the public schools we would lose our industry basically you guys know that we could never charge enough for infants through twos to make up for what we would lose in the um, age groups that we make the most money in except for after school and that's our number one in most cases it's believed that they there isn't the capacity in the public school system to um to go 100 percent there without the participation of the private education community so what i uh, will speak a little bit to the georgia model georgia is one of the few states i think florida is also but uh, florida is one of the few states that is 100 percent funded for a full day kindergarten program for every four year old and they have been for 20 years through their lottery what happened when that got implemented was that they did not have the capacity to put all of those children in the public schools if they had maybe they would have but also there were several people in the early education community in georgia that spent a lot of time educating decision makers about the impact on the early education industry if that happened but also that the early education industry was poised to provide programs that met these standards so what happens in georgia is if you meet their standards for teacher qualifications ratios equipment and there's grant money that goes along with it you can apply to have a class or 10 classes um, it's based on need in that area and if you provide that program then you get paid by the state system what i saw was a couple of things i'll just my opinion that happened at that time i think that it was a bit of a struggle financially because really not it's meant to be a break-even program but it's 8 30 to 2 30 so if you can keep those kids for after school or summer camp then you could do pretty well but most of them got used to not paying and they did other things in the summer so we really lost some ground in the four-year-olds but we kept the siblings um, also i think the inflation of quality happened in a lot of schools so you've got degree teachers and you've got uh, more grant money and i think it brought the overall quality level up but um I'm one that's watching this thing and really thinking that we've got some strong players that will continue to um, be sure that our political parties understand where we play in this industry and also that they don't really have the funding or the capacity to knock us out 100%. But we're watching it and smart for you to think about. A lot of that's just my opinion. What are your percentages for staffing, marketing, and rent? Um, thanks, Nancy. Um, I would say to you guys, email me for my benchmark pro forma. I've got it built so that you, at the top of this Excel, if you're an Excel fan, but if you're not, it's easy. Um, you can put in a school's license capacity and three-year-old tuition rate, and all the expenses will populate, so you can play around with it. You can do it for your school or another. It's not perfect because every school's different. And you may find that, you know, in some cases people are in a building that's donated and they cho choose to put that rent percent over into their staff. So there are differences, but what it will say to you, given this size school with this tuition rate, here's what the average school that's financially healthy in the US would spend in each category. So, um, Email me, I'm happy to shoot that over to you. And then uh, we have an hour on this also at shift. So love for you guys to join us there. I think I have maybe time for one more. And like I said, not gonna get to everybody, but let's, um, let's just hit the ones we can. Um, talked about percentage, okay, another one about percentages of revenue versus payroll. I'll give you the payroll ones real quick. Um, so I like to benchmark when the school's about 70% full for payroll, because if you're 60% or less, you have to have a director, you've got to have your lead teachers if you're gonna sell your curriculum, 
it's hard to meet the numbers I'm about to say. So your first thing to do is get your building to a healthy occupancy, 70%. Our model shows that for most schools, every dollar you add over 70% practically goes to the bottom line because your main costs are in place. You got a little more food, a little more supplies. Um, but at 70%, I like for a school to spend 45% on their salaries. That's their pay, hourly pay or salary, it's their vacation time, it's their holiday time. And I'm assuming a market rate director and assistant director if your school's big enough and all of your teaching team. All, the, all of the salaries that support your school. Then of course you have payroll taxes, which are another 10% of the salary, um, training, benefits, so all in. 55% uh, for your staff cost is a healthy number. It's really difficult when you've got, you know, if you go over 55% because we've got 25 for a building, 15 for other operational costs, and a couple of percent for admin costs, and it's gone at that point. So 70% just gets you barely squeaking forward with some cash flow. You really need to be above that to be healthy. I am running over time. You guys were um, awesome to stick with me the whole time. It's greatly appreciated. If you have other questions, if you want some of the resources that we mentioned, please um, email me, kligan at hingebrokers.com. You guys will get a survey immediately following. We're gonna ask you some questions about what you would like to see um, on our 2019 Masterclass series, what topics you'd like to see, and um, yeah, can I go backwards? Um, so uh, please answer the survey, give us some good feedback, um, give us some direction for next year. If you need to plug into any of our events or content, happy to send it to you. Thanks so much for joining and have a happy rest of your week.